and welcome to World Inside with Tian Wei, coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, during the just concluded BRICS summit, President Xi Jinping advocated Chinese solutions to global problems. What are the Chinese solutions, and are they applicable to all countries? Angela Merkel debated her challenger with three weeks to go until the German election. Did Merkel prove that she can still lead Europe and the Western world in America's absence? The 19th National Congress of the Communist Party of China will be convened on October the 18th. The meeting is likely to have a considerable bearing on China's future and people's lives. Analysts say that under Xi Jinping's leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, China has gone from a player in global affairs to a leader of the global agenda. How and why has China made this transition? Is it a big one? Let's find out. What has happened to the world and how should we respond? That's what Chinese solutions mean. In the recent BRICS summit in Xiamen, China, President Xi said that Chinese solutions on global governance have become more and more mature. We should speak with one voice and jointly present our solution to issues concerning international peace and development. These meet the expectations of the international community and will help safeguard of our common interests. This concept has been raised during other important occasions. During the APEC meeting held in Beijing in 2014, she proposed shaping the future through an Asian-Pacific partnership. In the G20 summit held last year in Hangzhou, China, she set the agenda of building an innovative, invigorated, interconnected and inclusive world economy. During the Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation in Beijing this year, she stressed to strengthen international cooperation in co-building the Belt and Road for win-win development. Since she took office in 2013, he has made great contributions to Chinese diplomacy. During his term, he has paid 28 state visits in addition to visiting 56 countries at several major international and regional organizations, clocking in a total of 57,000 kilometers in five years. Chinese solutions were explained in two aspects. One is building a human community of shared destiny. The other is building a new system of international relations with win-win cooperation. Xi has always been working on this, firmly following a road of socialism with Chinese characteristics, and looking forward to bringing a better future for China and people around the world. For more on the Chinese solutions, particularly when it comes to diplomacy and international affairs in Beijing, I have Professor Fu Jun from the School of Government with the Peking University. Welcome, Professor Fu. Also joining us in Beijing, Professor Xiong Li Li from the Director of the International Politics Department at the University of International Business and Economics. Also joining us, we have a longtime China observer in Washington, D.C., the U.S., Douglas Paul, Vice President of Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Gentlemen, I want to welcome the three of you to share your insights about what exactly is going on with China particularly the recent leadership. Let's talk about, Mr. Paul, your views from outside as an observer. Uh, since Chinese President Xi Jinping becomes the president of the country and also the party secretary, there seems to be a lot of new terminologies coming out. For domestic issues, it's about China dream. But for international affairs, it's about so-called common destiny. What is your interpretation of these different terminologies and do they work together, Mr. Paul? Well, I think that um, China is standing up on the international scene in ways it did not before. Uh, prior to Mr. Xi's arrival in the leadership role, the, the dictum was to China to uh, bide its time, the Tao Guang Yang Hui statement made by Deng Xiaoping some time before. And, uh, and with Mr. Xi's arrival, and particularly after the, the neighborly foreign affairs conference of 2013, We've seen China really cast aside the old dictum of biding one's time and to do out, go out and to do more. And we've seen China be more of a leader in our international forums, which is something that the U.S. has uh, hoped to see. But we've also seen China more assertive about its sovereign rights along its periphery. Mm. What about the Chinese guests, your views, response to uh, what Mr. Paul just said, and also your interpretation of this? Two things. 
One is China is being more vocal and more outspoken when it comes to its own views about the world and how the world is going. Secondly, uh, what would that mean for, let's just say, the leadership of the world and China's relations vis-a-vis -vis the other players, United States included? Professor Fu, I throw this big question to you first. <laughs> well, well, the well, world we, is on your shoulder, as you okay. say. <laughs> what we have seen are uh, some of the phenomena, uh, but there are deep structural forces uh, that has been going on. Yeah. If you just look at the economic dimension, uh, the matter of fact, of course, is now China is uh, number two in terms of GDP per capita. And uh, that uh, reflected mm. in personality, of course, is uh, they probably, uh, people probably will behave in a more uh, transparent way. And uh, in, in so far as a uh, leadership role, I would say, sort of uh, more uh, stepping out to the front. Is, okay. uh, this is the, what the world uh, is expecting China to do. Uh, uh, the, the phrase there, of course, it's a, a big country with uh, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, there were you know, words like assertiveness was also used in some description, let's like just say international media stories. What do you make of that? Assertiveness uh, uh, sort of uh, has a degree of arbitrariness, mm. uh, but just the being uh, transparent, uh, straightforward, with the benign intention, uh, I wouldn't use the word assertiveness. Okay, and Professor Xiong, what about your take, particularly the multilateral approach that seems China is very much embracing, let's just say, compared to what the current administration in the United States seem to indicate. Uh, at the United Nations 2015 and mm -hmm. also at the uh, uh, World Economic Forum earlier this year. You and I both were there to witness Chinese President mm -hmm. Xi Jinping give that speech and that was a game changer speech, some even say. Uh, Professor Xiong, do you think so? Mm. In fact, uh, in many foreign friends, international friends' eyes, there have been a great change in the style of China's diplomacy uh, in the past five years. Do you think that is yeah. true? Yeah, according to my opinion, uh, this change can be, uh, can be observed in three perspectives. Mm. On the whole, China has been more and more a provider of public goods to international community. And this kind of public goods can be observed in three perspectives. The first one is China has provided, uh, has more uh, material contribution to international community. Right. Now, that's, not, mm, that's not most important. The second one may be more important. That is China has been a more institutional contribution contributor to the international community, mm. such as G20, such as BRICS, such as uh, AIAB, such as Belt and Roads. And the third one may be most important. In the, far, in the past five years, China has been more and more an ideational contributor to the global governance, to the international community. That's maybe most important. Mm. And that may be the uh, most important, greatest change in the style of China's foreign policy. Mm. Very interesting what you have just said. China really has been trying to be a responsible major country in the global arena. According to the Chinese side, there are a lot of things that China has ever done to protect its own nationals, for example. Overseas China has conducted nine evacuations out of the overseas conflict zones. 100 cases of kidnapping or attacking Chinese abroad have been carefully handled. China has also played a central role in resolving issues of global concern, including Iran's nuclear program, wars in Syria, South Sudan, Afghanistan, and tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, Mr. Paul, talking about Korean Peninsula, you know better than I do, and probably many others, because you've been following for a long time. You see this uh, quite consisting, but at the same time, uh, different kinds of approaches China has been taken over the past few years, ranging from persuasion to sanctions, mm -hmm. ranging from discussion to eventually going to the United Nations work with the others but at the same time talking about parallel solutions. So you see a certain part of China foreign policy still remain as to what, where it was, but on the other hand, there are different components coming in as well as comprehensive ways of handling problems. Uh, Mr. Paul, I want to invite your wisdom here. Well, I think you've said it very well that we've 
Uh, China is not overthrowing the major contours of its uh, foreign policy. Uh, it has neighbors with long-standing histories of relations that it, uh, you can't ignore and will be part of uh, the content of any new attempt at foreign policy. But we you can't deny, and the statistics you raised at the outset of your uh, pro uh, program mm -hmm. show that there's been much more involvement by this leadership in China. And it reflects, as Professor Fu said, the structural changes that are taking place. The distribution of global productivity and wealth uh, is reflected now in the G20 and in the way in the BRICS, although uh, in, in the BRICS it's heavily weighted in the direction of China and then in India's direction as well because they're providing global growth. More than 50 percent of global growth is coming from these economies. Uh, so it's natural for the leadership to reflect this by being active and having China's voice. You know, uh, you mentioned the rescue of Chinese citizens overseas. I don't think anybody in China's leadership in 2011 knew that in Libya there were over 30,000 Chinese workers hmm. who suddenly needed to be uh, rescued from the deteriorating situation in Libya. Uh, the, t the growth since those early uh, realizations has been tremendous leading up to, for example, this past year's very successful rescue of Chinese workers in Yemen and China's continuing contribution to patrolling the pirates off Somalia. Mm. Yes, indeed. Uh, China has been trying to do also United Nations peacekeeping as well over the past few years. There have been quite some success. Meanwhile, Chinese soldiers also sacrificed their lives. These are sporadic stories, and yet all of them putting together, you see a country in transition when it comes to global responsibility and also global roles. Having said that, though, I do want to come back to what Mr. Paul mentioned, which is very important. When it comes to global governance, and a concept of global governance. It seems China, together with others, have been trying to work out some different approaches. Earlier, we got the Second World War. Everything is Bretton Woods, the United Nations. But now, there seems to be more complementary actions coming from China emerging economies. Professor Fu, you are running the South-South Cooperation Institute inside Peking University. So I want to pick your wisdom here. You think about it. Emerging economies, developing countries, the pie that they are building for the world economy is getting ever bigger. It is different, though, let's just say, from the earlier concept of South-South cooperation. This is a very new stage of that. How would you compare that? And what role China would play this time compared to earlier roles in the South-South cooperation? Professor Fu. Well, at the risk of uh, oversimplification, uh, if we think of uh, South South uh, cooperation in earlier period, and when you look at the world, the world can be roughly divided into two parts: mm. the developed one, uh, the developing world, and uh, you do not see uh, the interface between the two. And that coincides also with the Cold War as well. Yes, Cold War sort of uh, is just two parts. Nowadays, uh, you uh, sort of, uh, still roughly speaking, you see three parts. Mm. Advanced economies, emerging markets, developing economies. And it so happens uh, China now probably is in the uh, middle group, emerging markets. Mm. And now China has the resources. So it, we have uh, the wherewithal and also responsibility to help the less uh, lucky ones uh, to be all right. part of uh, the, gro uh, the growth of the global economy. So in that sense, uh, uh, in terms of feasibility, it's more feasible. In terms of uh, uh, a win-win uh, scenario, because uh, uh, you have the demand and the supply side, the right. economists will tell you, right, if you only have the supply side with the, without the demand side, you cannot uh, continue to grow your economy. So it makes a lot of sense for China to play uh, a bridge uh, linking advanced economies, less advanced you know, economies, sitting in the middle. So in that sense, uh, uh, it is a good idea to uh, continue uh, the same uh, words, but with a different uh, substance. Absolutely. Another thing is about partnership. Professor Xiong, mm. you've been working on the economic and trade issues of China, China foreign policy as well. You know, partnership has been so much mentioned when you have foreign dignitaries visiting China. 
it, it comes in so many different kinds of partnership when China is building relations these days. But you know, one crucial question, which might be also an intellectual question, that is, can you expect partnerships to solve problems? Because before, you see the international governance system very clear, very simple, after World War II. Uh, Cold War, and then you see the United States as a major power, and then now you see very different structures. So, will partnership be able to solve problems, particularly the hard issues, not just trade, but political, border issues, and many others to come? Mm. And in fact, I cannot just give a very brief answer to this question because uh, it's rather complicated. It is. But at least uh, partnership to some degree can be helpful for solution of some maybe the hardest issues such as border disputes, uh, such as the dis border disputes between China and India. And uh, frankly speaking, I cannot find a brief way to find a solution to the border issue between the two countries. It's really hard for both of the two countries. Uh, I, but, think, mm. I think another way to uh, think about that issue is in the absence of partnership, can you solve problems? That's a good point. That's a really so good point. So in that sense, uh, partnerships uh, uh, help? Mm. Now I want to go back to Mr. Paul, who have been attentively listened to your Chinese uh, panelists. Uh, will there, that partnership work uh, in terms of global governance? Can they? fill in to some of the absence of leadership these days? And what kinds of partnership or relationship, competition, cooperation between China and the United States, particularly under the current political environment in Washington? Mm. Well, we're, we are um, very importantly past the moment of unipolar power. Uh, the U.S. is uh, watching the return of great powers Russia, China, India, Europe. And uh, the question is, will this uh, return to great power and power balancing become hard-edged and difficult or mm. become manageable? Uh, I think China has a, has a big say in which way that turns out. With its neighbors, sometimes it, bit, it appears a bit hard-edged. At times, you see uh, ways of uh, cooperation being uh, discovered, as in the Philippines uh, South China Sea dispute with China more recent times. Uh, I think it's really important for China to engage with other uh, far-sighted leaders around the globe to try to create a new set of institutions or to adapt the old institutions to the new circumstances. I, I think for one we need a new Bretton Woods that embraces the major economies beyond the Victorious, victorious economies at the end of World War II, and we make adjustments to that. Some adjustments have been made in the voting shares at the IMF and the World Bank, and we have the ADB mm -hmm. and now the AIIB. I think these need to be integrated. They need to be made more systematic and respond to the needs of the new participants as well as the interests of the of the founders. Well, Mr. Paul, I did notice that you are using China needs to work with other uh, insightful leaders visionary leaders together to change the international system. Who are you exactly referring to? Are you referring to President Trump or uh, somebody else? Uh, if it's somebody else, uh, uh, will that leader or leaders have the capability and the weight to work with China, first of all, to respond to the United States, and secondly, work out new solutions, as you say, whether it's new Bretton Woods or other names? Mr. Paul. I think it's more likely going to be thought leaders rather than political leaders. Mm. Um, I mean, in Germany, uh, Angela Merkel is proving to be a very good leader, not just for Germany, but for Europe. Uh, in the United States, we're, we're having a time out for uh, national frustration with the failures of our political class to address the, the needs of the people who've been losers in recent trends in America, whether it's in the, the ethnic or uh, uh, incomes or middle class, uh, uh, we got a host of issues that need to be worked out in the U.S. And in the U.S., I would work with the people at the second tier of leadership in the various departments of the government uh, mm -hmm. because you're not going to find that kind of leadership at the very top of the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. uh, and, w and you look elsewhere for thought leaders. There are such people. Mm. One of the things people have been talking about as we are already running out of time, three minutes to go before we wrap up, is what's going to be the next biggest challenge? You know the challenge that you would see, 
very concrete in front of you, and that's going to be a test for China and the kinds of leadership, kind of international governance system China has been advocating. What would that be? How do you think China, with what attitude, will be able to come out front to tackle those challenges? I want to have the wisdom from every one of you. Professor Fu, you want to go first, briefly? Well, the challenges, we have a long list of uh, global uh, challenges, sure. but the, the basic uh, building block of international system continue to be nation state. So we, as human beings, feel the tension between uh, tribalism and globalism. And that has much to do with uh, education okay. and our, our capability. If our education uh, is such that we have a global uh, mission, then we'll be more on that side. And of course, uh, to go global, you also need to have uh, capabilities. Okay. Education, not only here in China, elsewhere in the world. What if there are different education? What to do with that difference? It's, it's got a lot of implications over there. Professor Xiong, briefly, very briefly. Mm. From the perspective of international relations, the major challenge may be a country, especially the major countries, how to deal with the balance between the global common interest and the nation's its own uh, interest. That's maybe most important, such as the United States, uh, America first, and the Brexit, uh, such mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. I see, but isn't that has always been the issue <laughs> over the yeah. years? Before we go, Mr. Paul, your thought. Before we go, Mr. Paul, your thought. Well, I think um, economic growth solves a lot of problems. It creates the resources for educational institutions, for social welfare, for taking care of our increasingly elderly populations. So I think the, the focus needs to be internationally on finding new sources of growth. The Trans-Pacific Partnership and the TTIP with Europe were intended to do that by opening greater amounts of services trade, which is increasingly part of the more advanced economies, including China's. And that we need to find global or at least regional leading to global arrangements to expand those trades mm. and opportunities and, uh, and, and get more money in all of our pockets. More inclusive arrangements so that people, all parties could participate. I guess from China there's a Belt and Road Initiative, but I guess we'll need to have further time to discuss that in the future. For now, I want to thank the three of you. This is a quite abstract topic, and yet, as you all know very well, this is a very important topic. Thank you so much. Douglas Paul in the United States, here in Beijing, Fu Jun, and Xiong Li Li. Really appreciate you gentlemen for being with us. You're watching World Insight with Tianwei. Still to come on our program. Angela Merkel debated her challenger with three weeks to go until the German election. Did Merkel defend her track record as chancellor, especially in the face of populism? and the refugee crisis. Welcome back. You're watching World Insight with Tianwei coming to you live on CGTN. The German federal election on September the 24th is just three weeks away, and Angela Merkel is looking to secure a fourth term as chancellor of Germany. On Sunday, Merkel and her rival, Martin Schulz, had the only TV debate before the federal election. The two faced off on issues ranging from the refugee crisis to Turkey. Over 16 million people watched the 90-minute showdown, and polls gave Merkel the clear edge over Schulz. On Tuesday, the German leader stressed the themes of moderation and also consensus in her final state of the national address, a chance for her to propose her agenda if re-elected. Latest polls show that Merkel's CDU party and their Bavarian CSU sister enjoy a 17 percentage point lead over Schultz SPD. But some believe that Schultz may still have a chance of some Sort. So, can Merkel stave off this latest challenger and win the German federal election? And what about her party? Let's loop in our panelists. Joining us, of course, in Germany, we have with us Timo Lokocki, who is a transatlantic fellow at the Europe program at the German Marshall Fund. Welcome, sir. Have you back. Great to have you. In Brussels, Belgium. We are joined by Jens van Rietelmeyer, I hope I pronounced your name right, sir, who is a policy analyst in the European Policy That's Center. Okay. <laughs> All right, then. With that confirmation, let me jump Hello. 
right Thanks. into the discussion. Mr. Lokaki, how much chance do you think Ms. Merkel and her party, three weeks from now, the election? Well, it looks like uh, Angela Merkel is very well equipped to win this election. There is hardly any doubt that she's going to come out as leader of the strongest party. The key question probably is with whom she's going to govern. Another grand coalition or a coalition with a rather smaller coalition partner, the Liberals, the FDP, or the Greens. However, the most important takeaway from the TV debate is probably that Martin Schulz is most likely not going to be the next German Chancellor. Mm, agree with that, Mr. Rittenmeyer? Yeah, I surely agree with that. Uh, we are not sure that Angela Merkel is going to be re-elected for a first term. And the main question is going to be, indeed, uh, what score exactly will the four smaller party uh, have? Uh, and this will determine uh, the, the coalition, mm. uh, and then it will shape uh, German policy. The German election process results in a seat distribution that is very close to the proportions of the national popular vote. Merkel's CDU and the coalition with the Christian Socialist Union should remain the largest bloc. The latest poll also predict show Merkel, CDU, CSU bloc winning 40% of Bundestag seats and Schultz, SPD winning 24%. AFD, who don't even have a single seat in the parliament are expected to get 9% left-leaning parties. The left, Greens, and Free Democratic Party are polling at 9%, 9%, and 8%, respectively. A 50% majority could be reached if Merkel form a coalition with both the Greens and the FDP. OK, a lot of politics about Germany. Gentlemen, you have to help us to explain all of this. Uh, what about these two parties? What exactly are the major points of their campaign? Together, what is the common ground between Merkel's party and these two? Mr. Lokaki. Well, uh, one of the defining features of German politics is that the polarization and the polemics which we see from other mm -hmm. Western European democracies, France, UK, or the United States, it's not to be found here. The two major parties, the SPD, the central left, and the center right, CDU, CSU, more or less agree on most issues, most certainly foreign policy and European politics. This is also an explanation why they are not as strong as they could be because they struggle to mobilize their voters. The smaller parties, the ones you just mentioned, in have a very clear cut policy alternative formulated to the two big parties. And the question uh, how German politics will be waged in the foreseeable future will depend who or which of these smaller parties will join the next coalition. Mm. And this coalition will then decide German policies. Right. But at the same time, Mr. Rittelmeyer, it is no doubt if Chancellor Merkel become once again the chancellor after this election with the coalition that she's likely to build with the party and some of the others, She's going to be the fourth time there. That is so rare a phenomenon, I would say, in European politics, in German politics as well. What would that mean? Well, uh, this will be uh, impressive, and she, she, she will be uh, equaling her father in, 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 in uh, politics, uh, Edmund uh, Kohl, a uh, spiritual father. Uh, and uh, well, this is just reflecting uh, the German state of mind and the state of, of Germany. Uh, Germany is going well eco economically. Uh, Germans are aspiring to, to stability in a very troubled env uh, environment uh, internationally uh, with uh, Trump's election, with threats coming from North Korea, with internal threats in the EU with the Brexit, with Iberaris developing uh, in several countries. Uh, the, the Germans have with Chancellor America an anchor of stability mm. uh, that provides continuity. So when things are going quite well, why not just continuing? Uh, interesting, but at the same time, both of you know Chancellor Merkel very smooth in her transitional policies and transitional opinions. She could say here one thing today while changing it smoothly to another thing tomorrow. And, but the voters, you know what? 
are very happy with that. They are not challenging her about her change of positions over the days, weeks, and months. How would you make? How should you understand that phenomenon, Mr. Lokaki? Well, this is not exactly true. There are a lot of German voters which do not agree with these、uh, opinion swings of her, which is the, one of the prime reasons why there is a new party forming.、Mm. The German Alternative for Germany is currently polling at 10 percent, which is,、uh, you might say, an historical、uh, exception because in Germany there tends to be no far right. So Angela Merkel say、uh, swift changes of policies led to a certain percentage of German、uh, German voting straight there to be. Disenchanted with the governing conservatives, and they now flock to the AfD. However, you rightfully pointed out the majority of German voters is very happy with the chancellor's style,、mm. which is probably due to her managing the current crisis rather well.、Mm. Well, Mr. Rittmeier, you know the refugee crisis, for example, has been one of the latest, the biggest challenge for Chancellor Merkel. I mean, she was pretty much pro it:、uh, refugees come over to Germany. Let's just Be a family, but later, of course, things have changed.、Uh, do you think she is making making smooth transition in that regard? And what would this kind of changing of attitude be a lesson or be a plus for her in the election?、Um, I think that integrating refugees is is a fundamental challenge for、uh, Germany's、uh, future, but. The situation has calmed down over the summer.、Uh, illegal, immigration, illegal immigration seems to be more under control,、mm. and、uh, we don't see major differences between、uh, the main German parties on 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 this、uh, on this issue. German citizens and party、uh, would like to get more support from other、uh, EU member states、uh, regarding、uh, the refugees,、uh, but then we see some slight differences uh, between between. Uh, The party, except、uh, if we look at、uh, the more、uh, radical parties, so Alternative for Germany and the radical left,、uh, but the other parties uh, converge uh, on, on this issue, and、uh, this is why also why Martin Schulz had so many difficulties really differentiating himself from、uh, Angela Merkel during the whole campaign.、Mm. One of the things people have been talking about outside Germany is. There has been a lack of challengers for Chancellor Merkel over the decade when she is in power. Some say, "What is happening to German politics?" Others say, "Well, probably Germany is just doing very well, you know." And everybody say, "Well, if she's there, Germany is well. Let her be."、Um, which do you think is actually the real picture? Has the German political system be able to churn out new talents and new thoughts? Let's go to Mr. Lohaki first. Well,、um, what you kind of insinuate on is that the German system would be incapable of political change. That's not true. What you currently see is that the CDU sees you as a party which is extremely successful to offer, say. An atmosphere in which a lot of German people feel quite comfortable. In what we should not forget is that up until ten years ago,、uh, the German economy was in very dire shape. Germany was referred to as the sick man of Europe、hmm. up until the mid 2000s. So, in the last decade, the economic revival of Germany for Germans is an exception and not the normality. And now a lot of Germans associate these economically benign times with the current CDU CSU government,、mm. and this uh, setting, uh, this alignment of political stars, if you will, is an extreme advantage to the CDU CSU and Angela Merkel, and it's extremely difficult for any challenger from any party, you might say, to. Um, branch in this phalanx of good news the CDU sees who can convey on a daily basis. Right, it is the economy is stupid, as a quote was so popularly used for decades. Right,、uh, it is about the economy, but at the same time, Mr. Rittmeier, what has she done right? What do you think should be the brief list that should, you know, be put under Chancellor Merkel and say she has done this right? Well, I, I think it's the economy, but it's also、um, 
the characteristic of German politics, which is made of consensus and building coalitions, mm -hmm. and the fact that part parties uh, are also moving a lot to the center, and Merkel especially, has been moving her own party, the Christian Democrats, a lot uh, to the center. And then, as you said, there is a question, what's going to come next if we have another grand coalition. We are still not sure we are going to have another grand coalition because the SPD will, will be quite reluctant and especially party members will be quite reluctant to enter in another uh, coalition in which they will yeah. be the junior partner and then probably suffering uh, at uh, well, elections uh, because of this, of this status. Uh, Marty Schulz looked like almost a perfect challenger against Angela Merkel because he was an outsider. Uh, he was coming from the EU scene. He was uh, not involved in the coalition government. Yeah. Uh, he wasn't in German politics when uh, Gerhard Schröder did the tough reforms. He, he looked at the perfect challenger and we had a surge in the polls in favor of his party uh, just after they okay. nominated him. Uh, but we have seen uh, that then it, he really had difficulties during the campaign uh, facing Angela Merkel, who is really West established. Mr. Lokaki, you know what? Germany has been described as a, let's just say, reluctant leader of the European Union or of Europe, and yet very active global player. How should we understand these descriptions about Germany under Angela Merkel when she is in power? And will that characteristics continue as we see ever more disintegration possibly of the European Union and as we see the international system, international player lists have also been on the move or rather changed. Mr. Lokaki. Hmm. Well, Germany's economy and Germany's defense and Germany's international alliances always benefit from German diplomacy. That means that the geographical position of Germany obliges almost to look for a diplomacy as the first choice. Which means that any German Chancellor will try to forge alliances, try to strike a middle ground with its most important allies, which of course means that the European partners come first. The most important partner here is France and then the United States. Meaning that in the current, uh, current time that the French had some difficulties to get their power on the road, as you can say, the Germans were very cautious not being too adamant, being too fearful with their newly ascribed leadership role, because they feel way better when they lead with partners, mm. especially with the French. Which means that currently, after the French elections, the Germans will now wait for President Emmanuel Macron mm. to help them to forge the new European Union in a strong, Franco-German tandem. And this, you might say, is regardless of whom is leading Germany. Well, Germany will look to France and the United States as the prime partners. What you might say, yes, France, United States, but look at the two presidents of the two countries. One is supporting rating is really going down since the election time in France, for example, and in the United States, you know the political debate and the chaos going on. So when you say Germany wants to look at these two partners and let them take the lead and Germany will follow and cooperate, that's not likely to happen. So Mr. Rittelmeyer, in that circumstances, what's likely to be the choice of Germany? What do you think the public would want the Chancellor Merkel to do if a coalition government is being formed? Well, um, if it's Merkel or Schulz, but as we said, it's, it's probably going to be, uh, almost certain, going to be uh, Chancellor Merkel. Yeah. Uh, well, the main German parties have very similar position on, on foreign policy. Uh, Germans know they have to take more responsibility in the world and in the euro. And uh, German uh, approach is not based on, on hard power. Uh, it relies on diplomacy, on multilateral framework. And in this regard, the EU channel uh, is an essential one uh, for the Germans. And especially, uh, as uh, my, my colleague just said, mm. uh, a strong relationship uh, with France will be essential to, to shape the future of the, of the EU. Um, so we will uh, see very soon after the German election proposal coming from France regarding the future of the euro and especially yeah. the future of the eurozone and uh, the results of the German election are not going to change a lot how Germany will reply uh, to uh, such position. 
I see. Before we go, I do want to invite both of your insights about, you know, from now until the election, three weeks ago, a lot of things could happen. Ratings sometimes doesn't work. Sometimes just, you know, a crisis happen from time to time. It would change the picture. What is likely, do you think, the chance once again for Chancellor Merkel and her party? And eventually, where do you think after this election, Germany is moving to politically wise? Let's go to Mr. Lokaki first. 30 seconds for you. Only 30 seconds, sir. It's hardly imaginable that anything happens which can really chance, challenge Angela Merkel. The question is with whom she's going to govern. And I think given the proximity of German parties, German foreign policies will remain very steady regardless of the outcome of the coalition formation. Very steady, Mr. Rittelmeier? Um, well, I, I also think uh, not much can happen during these uh, three weeks. Uh, then after the elections, uh, it could end up being a complicated situation I if uh, the SPD, for example, does not want again to join a grand coalition or if uh, the uh, conservative, uh, so the Christian Democrats and Angela Merkel and the liberals uh, are not able to have a majority. If we have to experiment for the first time uh, a three-party coalition at federal level, uh, then it will be very challenging uh, for, for these parties. A lot of drama, even after the election. We are looking forward to it. What's going to be the ending story? Thank you so much, Lokaki and Rito Meyer. Really appreciate it. That is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Inside CGTN, in your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Sydney Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on World Inside team, thanks for watching and tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.